Now, on to the webinar. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, uh, Shattered But Stronger Than the Past, Interacting, Aiding, and Understanding Those with Post-Traumatic Stress Injury. Today we have with us J.P. McMichael, who actually also presented for us at this year's um, Corrections and Law Enforcement Conference, and we are pleased to again have him do this presentation for us. So with that, I'm going to hand it, uh, hand it over to J.P. McMichael. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. <clears throat> um, today, I'm going to take you on a journey. And I'm hoping throughout this journey that I am able to enlighten you a little bit on the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, as well as to give you some helpful hints on when you are interacting with someone that has post-traumatic stress, whether it be in an employment area, in a personal setting, in an education area, whatever it may be. Slide number nine, please. So today I'm going to go over, I'll give you my introduction in just a minute, uh, and then we're going to go over the basics of what is post-traumatic stress. Uh, PTS by the numbers, the effects of PTS, who's affected by it, how the Americans with Disabilities Act interacts with PTS, and then interacting with the individual. And then we're going to wrap up with coming out on top. And that's how I'm going to end my journey. At the end of the day, we're going to go through the closing piece of this, and then I will answer any questions that you may have along the way. Um, and at the end of this, I will also provide my contact information if you have any further questions that you may come up with um, after we're done today that may pop into your head at some point. So if we can go to slide 10. So we're looking at a picture of the kanji, the Chinese characters for crisis. And oftentimes when we think about crisis, we think about the bad part of it. We think about how it impacts us negatively. Yet when you look at the kanji, it's made up of danger, an opportunity. Most of the time, people don't think about the opportunity piece of this. But when we take time to reflect on the past and we look back at trauma or crisis that we may have gone through at some point, it's at that point where you may have seen the opportunity. And when I say opportunity, I mean the growth that occurs. Because not everything that comes out of trauma is bad. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, I will make you a believer in that statement. You can go to slide 11. So, my journey. A lot of times when you go to conferences and you see speakers, you're asking, why is this person speaking on this topic? So I have 23 years in law enforcement. I'm in my 23rd year right now. I'm also the owner of Catalyst of Change Associates, which is a consulting company. And I also go out and do public speaking on PTSD, um, the epidemic of suicide, leadership, and bullying and body image for kids. And you may ask, how does that come into play? When I started Catalyst of Change, I wrote three children's books. Um, one on my interactions with my son regarding my own battles with PTSD. One on body image and anti-bullying for children. And then my daughter got upset because my son had a book with him in it. So I wrote one about her, which entails the milestones that you go through as a father with your daughter from the time she was born, imagining for myself, imagining up to the point where she gets married. Um, I'm also a professor at Marymount University. So I have a lot of 
a lot of things going on. I got my master's in counseling in 2017 from Liberty University and my undergraduate from American Military University in criminal justice. My journey begins on September 11th of 2001. I was one of the first responders to the Pentagon on 9-11. And in that response, my entire life changed. I was diagnosed later with PTSD from that response. And I'll tell you now, as I speak to my students, many of them were just born or had only been alive for a few years. So I feel quite old when I start talking about this now. Um, I was standing in court that day, a call came over the radio, or actually we had somebody come into the courtroom that told us that a plane had hit one of the towers in New York. So myself and the other officer I was working with, we looked at each other and we thought, that's odd, it's probably you know, an accident, some medical issue or something happened and the person hit the building. A little bit later, we got word that the second plane hit. And we knew at that point something was going on. Where our courthouse stands in Arlington, we have a clear view of the Pentagon. And it was a little while after that, that we have an all call that goes out over the radio, which is a loud audible tone whenever there's an emergency. So that came across the radio. And when that happened, one of our officers came across, or one of the officers from Arlington came across and said, the Pentagon is on fire. And then one of our officers came across and said, the Pentagon is not on fire. I'm on 110, the plane flew over my head into the side of the building. We knew at that point that we were under attack. And we got out of the courthouse um, and I went on my own over to the Pentagon. I was over there probably 10 minutes after the plane hit, 15 minutes, somewhere in there. But I can still tell you to this day, going around the corner and seeing that building for the first time, I still have it emblazoned in my in my brain people were running out of the building as far as they could get away from the building while we were running towards it as we were running towards it there were alerts going out over the pa system about the building being unstable and you would have to run back 500 feet and then approach it again to try and get people out same thing over and over again. At one point during this, we had another call go over the radio that there were there was another plane inbound, and it was coming up the Potomac. And at that point, they began doing a countdown. So they counted down five minutes out. A minute later, the audible kicks up four minutes out, three minutes out, two minutes out. And then they called it off. But in that time, I know, and speaking to the other officer that was with me, at that point, we thought we were going to die. Um, I was unable during any of that first part of that day to reach any of my family. Cell phones were not working. And in the morning, up until the afternoon, we didn't have time. It was just too, it was too hectic. Um, trying to get people out of the building, setting up crime scene, all of that stuff. It was just way too hectic. I didn't even know what happened at um, the New York site until probably that weekend. That's how much running around we were doing. But... In that time, things began to change. And that started it all up. I started having flashbacks. Um, I could smell things, hear things, and I didn't think anything of it. I just thought this was a bad, bad, bad incident. Um, but this went on and on and on and on and on. 
And it wasn't until 2003 when I got diagnosed with PTSD. And in that year, which is probably one of the worst years of my life, I was diagnosed with PTSD. I was in our honor guard at the time and coming home from National Police Week, had a young woman stop in front of me going 60 miles an hour. And I had enough time to get out, oh, and then went into the windshield. Suffered a lot of injury from that. And then found out that my wife was leaving. Because she could not deal with the fact that every day I was coming home, I was going upstairs. I was locking myself in a room. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to be around anybody. Um, life was unbearable, to say the least. And she had just had enough. And when she left, that was pretty much the bottom for me. And come October, and I'll talk about this later as well, but in October, I almost took my life that year. Because of all of the pain and suffering that was associated with this PTSD and not being able to get this incident out of my head. And you would think that just that piece there would be enough to stop this journey thing. But then in, you know, as moving forward, I got some treatment, I got a little better, things are going good. Um, and then in 2011, found out a buddy of mine that was like a brother to me. He's in his early 30s, an officer for our um, police department. Finds out he has cancer. He collapsed during a training. And in the matter of one year, I watched him go from being a member of the SWAT team, military vet, to laying in a bed, not being able to communicate. And he eventually passed away. During the time that was going on, buddy I grew up with that I played baseball with, a Maryland State Trooper. I got a call from my ex-wife one night, and she said, did you hear about John? And I said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. John had been involved in a bad shooting. Um, and the effects of that, when I say bad shooting, it wasn't wrong on his end. It was the circumstances around it were bad for him. He ended up with PTSD because of that. A year from the date of that shooting, as he was coming across the Bay Bridge, because he lived out in that area, his mom was driving. He said, I'm not feeling well. And he asked her to stop and pull over on the bridge. And when she did, he opened the door and jumped. So within a couple of months of finding out about my one friend, somebody else that I was good friends with, complete suicide. So I began to go back down that spiral again. And when Jeff passed away in January of 2012, that really pushed me back down into the, to the rabbit hole again, into that spiral going downhill, starting with the depression, um, having flashbacks about stuff. But at that point, I had an outlet because prior to going into this job, I was a wrestler. And then I began training in Muay Thai and became a cage fighter. And doing that training, I had the ability to get a lot of aggression out there. In that. And it was a way for me to um, get my head clear. So I go down and I'm competing in a tournament, 2012, 
And I've got another, I've got a fight coming up at the end of the year. Go down and do decent in this tournament. And then I get, start training. I think it was around October-ish of that year. I'm training and my neck pops. And that leads me down another road because I get told I'm not going to be able to fight anymore. And when you look at this journey as we go through this today, you're going to see all these little side roads that go off. And when you, when you begin to reflect back, on yourself your life where you're at where you're going where you've been you will see these little branches that go off and you'll see these crises that you've gone through and hopefully you'll be able to see the opportunity that comes out of that because as you'll see when we go through this as bad as all that sounds there was a lot of opportunity that came out of it slide 12 please So I'm a big tattoo guy. I think I'm at 22 or 23 tattoos now. This tattoo is one of my favorites. And I have it tattooed, if you can see it on my wrist right there. So that every day I see it. Because in October of 2003, When I sat in my house alone and I wrote my note out, the only thing that kept me from taking my life that day was at the very moment I started to pull the trigger back, my wife, who had left already, popped into my head and I knew that if I did that at that point that she would be the one to get blamed for it because nobody knew what was going on and this is part of what really ramped everything up was I felt like a huge failure at that point because she had left me and I didn't tell anybody uh, my parents my sister both lived in the same town as me right down the street but I always made excuses. She was in graduate school at the time, and I always made excuses why she wasn't there. But it was after that moment when I began to get help. And the picture that you're looking at here with the word warrior and the semicolon replacing the I The semicolon represents where an author could have ended a sentence with a period. But he decided or she decided to go on. And that's what this tattoo represents for me. All the stuff that I've been through, as bad as it was that day in October of 2003, I decided to go on. And I am hopeful that those of you that are listening, if you are somebody with PTS, if you know somebody with it, or if at some point you encounter somebody with it, you work with someone with it, that you're able to get something out of this that will assist you to help yourself or them better understand what they're going through so that they too continue on and don't end that sentence. Slide 13, please. So I said I was a fighter at one point. This is a picture of my last, this is a championship match at the Naga Championships. Um, back in 2012, it was August of 2012. I was doing this as a, as a uh, kind of a precursor to the match I had coming up at the end of the year. 
did decently, got up to championship match, and ended up losing there, but still a good day. Um, but as I was training later, a few months later, there was a pop in my neck and I lost feeling in my arms. Not a good sign. It was very brief, but I knew something wasn't right. So I went to the doctor. They did all kinds of tests on me. And initially when they did the testing, they did a brain scan because of how high up the injury was. And they said, we think you might have early onset MS. So I'm reading the symptoms and everything and all the stuff that I'm going through, and it's all the same symptoms. So I'm stressing big time now. Um, and then it's probably the next week, I had another appointment with a bunch. I had so many appointments, it's hard to keep track of them. But they did another scan, and they discovered that my neck was fractured, and the bone was protruding into that end. He told me that if my if this was my neck, about that much of it was not severed. It was not cracked. So I had to have surgery done. And this was five, six, and seven. They had the fuse. I've got these lovely scars, if you can see them in here. Um, and he told me he might be able to fight again. So I was like, all right, that, that's great. That, you know. I'm not the, the brightest guy, but you know, it's like it gave me something to work towards. But then a year later, I'm standing at a store, lost feeling in my arms and legs. And when that happened, I had to go back. And again, it was like, I think, 20, 30 seconds. It wasn't a long time, but it was very similar to what happened before. I went back to the same surgeon and did the same tests and he came back and he said, this is not good. Now it's up to two. And it's the same thing that your disc, we tried to put it off, you can't wait. So within a few weeks of that, I was going in for surgery. And in the prep before the surgery, a few days before when they're going through the stuff um, to get me ready for everything, he said, you have to have the surgery. If you don't, you definitely won't be able to walk. And if you have it, I can't guarantee that you'll be able to walk, but you have a better shot than if you don't have it. So all the stuff I've been through. Now I'm being told that they don't know if I'm going to be able to walk. So now I'm looking at not only not being able to be active, but never being able to be a cop again. And again, back down. I think that day I sat in the parking lot and probably cried for two hours. And the night before the surgery, I stood in my kid's doorways because I didn't tell my wife, I didn't tell anybody what the doctor said. But I stood in their doorways and I cried and I didn't sleep that night because I, I didn't know what was going to happen. But fortunately, as you can see, I am standing up and when the surgery got done, they had to go in and pull everything out that they had done for five, six and seven, fuse two through seven. So now my entire neck is titanium. And he had told me during that time when I went back and it was two weeks later. You're not going to be able to be an officer again. So if you can go to the next slide, please, number 14. So I don't know if you're going to be able to walk. You're not going to be able to be an officer again. Now, I don't know about most people, but I don't do well with people telling me I can't do something. I'm very stubborn. So I said, all right, that's great, but you don't know who you're talking to. I will be able to do this again, and I'm going back to work. At that point, I didn't have, you know, I've got a couple years left now, but I wasn't letting, I wasn't retiring early. 
and I had two little kids I had to go home to. So they did the surgery, and I wake up as they're rolling me down the hall, and the nurse taps me on the shoulder, and she's like, all right, get your big butt up, and walk in the room. So that was my first victory right there. This picture I took when I finally was able to wake up and get ungroggy and stuff and settled in there. Never, never allow the opinions of others to determine the path that you're on. And I say that because as I was laying there, I wondered how many other people this doctor had told this to. And they just said, okay. I've wondered since then how many people have been told this is how your life is going to be. When I go to the Americans with Disability Act conferences and I meet all of these amazing people, I wonder how many of them were told you're never going to be able to do this again. You're not going to be able to go here. You're not going to be able to go there. You're not going to be able to get an education. And how many of them took it to heart? And how many of them said, you don't know who you're talking to? One of the biggest parts of PTSD is finding a way to stay positive. And many times it involves your support system because it's very hard for you to see your value. You see yourself as a burden. You don't see anything good about you. One of the things that I learned from that was the power of positive thinking and keeping notes around my house for me to see every day and keeping my mind right. Slide 18, please, or slide 15, I'm sorry. Picture here is of one of Charles Spurgeon's quotes, and it says, whenever God means to make a man great, he always breaks him into pieces first. When I first read this, That quote hit me like a million pounds in the chest because I always felt like I was shattered. I always felt like I was a completely different person after 9-11, that I had lost everything and that I was constantly running around trying to pick the pieces up. But I go back to the piece about reflecting. And the importance of taking a step back and looking at what you've overcome and where you've come from to where you are now. Slide 16, please. And this is another of my favorite quotes because my philosophy is that we all are on a, on a path. We're on a journey and our path leads us throughout life. And as you're along, going along your path, you'll meet people. And it may be for a split second, it may be for years, maybe for a lifetime. But each person that we meet has a purpose in our lives to teach us something. It's a matter of if you're open to learn that lesson. And you may not get that lesson today. It may be something down the road where something happens and you think back to your interaction with that individual. And you go, okay, that's why I ran into them. When I look back at my journey, when I look back at my battles with PTSD, there are is person after person after person that came into my life that helped me. And I may not have seen that at that time, but looking back at it, 
I see the impact that they have. Next slide, please. So when we look at what is post-traumatic stress, it's defined as an anxiety disorder resulting from an episode to an experience involving direct or indirect threat, where you have serious harm or threat of death. Next slide, please. This is another picture. I'm a, I'm a very picture-oriented person. And this picture of the person with their head in their hands, where their elbows are resting on PTSD, and their body is made up of all the words that describe what PTSD is, whether it's feeling like a burden, insomnia, feel abandoned because nobody wants to be around you, you blame yourself for everything, guilt, shame, it all makes up what PTS consists of. Next slide, please. So when we look at the causes and then into the symptoms. As I said, it's triggered by an event and they, they define it as a terrifying event, but it's any event where you fear serious harm or death. Your symptoms last for more than 30 days and it substantially limits one or more major life activities. You have acute, which is when it lasts, the symptoms last less than three months, and chronic, where it lasts longer than three months. And sometimes you are, when you get help, if you've had this one incident and the stuff begins happening and you immediately get help for it, the cause is easy to determine. But when you look at military and law enforcement who they are constantly bombarded with things, and in those fields, we are very, uh, we keep everything very close to us. We're not big on talking to people. So we may be experiencing these things like I did, but I kept thinking to myself, oh, I can take care of this. I'm good. I know what I'm doing. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and more and more happened. Then it becomes much more difficult to find out what the cause of this stuff is. You're looking at symptoms. Big ones are avoidance. You withdraw from everybody. That was mine. I would go home at night. I would lock myself in a room. It was dark. I didn't want to be around anybody. I didn't want to talk to anybody because I didn't know how to handle it. You have negative changes in your beliefs. I can look at myself before 9-11 and look at myself after 9-11. And I was a very happy-go-lucky guy before 9-11. And I'm much different now. I think over the years I've gotten a lot better, but I still have those days where I have to battle these demons. You stop trusting people. And then you get into hyper arousal where everything, you have to be aware of everything going on around you. Sights, sounds, the smells, anything can bring back that instance. Flashbacks. That was huge for me. Anytime that that radio alert went off, I was back at the scene. If I smelled fuel, back at the scene. 
and I could be standing here talking to you and I would be back at the Pentagon with everything going on around me the same as it was that day. And I couldn't get it out of my head. You have emotional numbness. All the things you wanted to do before, you have no interest in. You may have wanted to hang out with your friends, sports, things like you want nothing to do with them anymore. It's just you want to be alone and you want to get away from everything. And you try to avoid everything. You begin to argue with your faith. Your mood can change at the drop of a hat. You can be very happy one minute and the next minute you're angry and you don't know why. Can't concentrate. And you don't sleep. I don't know how often I slept in those two years, but it didn't seem like much. You'll see people that are very well kept. They keep up with themselves. Their appearance is always pristine. And when they begin suffering from PTS, they become disheveled. Because they're not sleeping. They're not eating. They're not taking care of themselves. When you look at well, one of the best portrayals of this that I've seen was Bradley Cooper in the movie American Sniper. He played the role of someone with PTS spot on. And it was so spot on and me not, I knew what the movie was about, but I didn't know that was where they were going to go with it. And I was sitting in that movie theater just bawling because that was me. There's a scene where he's sitting in a chair and he's hearing all the battlefield sounds. And he's looking at a TV and they're coming in from behind the TV. And I already knew the TV wasn't on. And as they pan around, you see that. But that's what PTS is. It's constant reliving of the same thing over and over and over and over. And you stop wanting to do all the things that you've done before. And this trickles down very quickly to everybody around you. Next slide, please. So to D or not to D. I always referred to this as PTSD. And I went up to Canada to speak at their national conference on crisis and trauma. And Mindy and Chris Piva, who are a law enforcement EMT couple that both had PTS. And she posed the question to D or not to D. Because throughout the day, you heard people refer to it as PTSD for disorder, PTSI for injury, or just PTS. Some people gave reasons that it's an injury, it can get better, the disorder has a stigma to it. Um, whatever the, the reasoning is, I will leave that to you to decide whether or not you call it a, dis, a disorder or an injury, or just PTS for sure. Next slide, please. So when we look at PTS by the numbers, and when you do research on this, these numbers are all over the place. I tried to get numbers that were matching across the board. So 8% of the population will at some point have PTSD. Over 8 million adults have PTSD during any given year. It affects 10% of women and 4% of men. And then when you look at children, 
15 to 43 percent of girls under the age of 18 and 14 to 43 percent of boys under the age of 18 experience at least one trauma throughout that time period. Three to 15 percent of girls and one to six percent of boys will develop PTSD because of the trauma that they have endured. 60% of men and 50% of women experience at least one trauma in their lifetime. About 37% of those that are diagnosed with PTSD are classified as having severe symptoms. And women are twice as likely as men to develop PTSD during their lifetime. And that one I have to look into because that kind of shocked me. Because I always, from myself, knowing how much I don't like talking about stuff, but from the women that I know, they're very open about talking about their feelings and what they're going through. So that, that number shocked me. When we look at the college, um, the education piece of this, if we can go to slide 23, go to the next slide. So you can see a 2017 research study found nearly 1 million post 9-11 veterans were returning to college. So you're getting all these veterans going back to school, law enforcement going back to school. And when we talk about PTS, that is the that is the group that most people reference very quickly. 30 37% of part-time and 16% of full-time veterans dropped out within nine months of enrollment. And it was because they're coming back from these combat scenarios, from being overseas, and trying to transition back into life. Law enforcement officers, firefighters, they've had these calls that have impacted them to the point where they have PTS, and now they're trying to sit in a classroom and focus and concentrate. The veterans stated it was a hard transition from the structure of the military back to college life. Military life is very structured. Now you're coming back to being able to come and go as you want. And many stated that they found college chaotic and confusing. And then when you look at the comorbidity with PTS, the alcohol and the substance abuse that goes along with it for a lot of veterans and a lot of law enforcement because try to find ways to dull the pain that we're going through and to stop what's going on. And then you're throwing in trying to focus on school. And it becomes a very hard situation. And again, this is a group that is not used to asking for help and they're not going to ask for help. You go to the next slide, please. And when you look at the number that have dropped out, or maybe look at the number that are just struggling. As a professor, when you look at the students and they're struggling with assignments, PTS is not something we can see. There is no face for PTS. You can't look at somebody with PTS and go, hmm, they got it. There's no clue if they don't ask for help or if you're not aware of those signs and symptoms of PTS 
and you start to pick up things as you're watching them or reading what they're writing about or just observing them or listening when you're asking questions and they may throw a hint here and there because they don't want to come right out and say I'm struggling. One of the things that struck me very deeply was that 14.9 percent let me rephrase that people with PTS are 14.9 percent more likely to attempt suicide than those without it. And when you then throw in what's going on right now with COVID and the isolation that people are facing on top of all that, it's magnifying the effects. Suicide numbers are going. Fortunately, in law enforcement, one of the things that I do outside of this is every night I do a weighted ruck walk where myself and another couple of folks across the country carry a pound of weight for every officer that has completed suicide in the country. And while we're doing it, we shoot these videos to try and bring awareness, um, to try and get people to talk and just whatever's on our minds we talk about. Last year, just in law enforcement, we had 228 documented suicides. And when I checked the other day, I think we're at 149. And the awareness since last year has shot through the roof. It's huge. Everybody's finally talking about it. But 149 suicides is still 149 too many. And when you begin to look at the effects of PTS, whether it's relationship issues, low self-esteem, um, the substance abuse piece, now you're throwing COVID in. So you have people that are losing jobs, people that are not allowed to see their families or their support systems. Um, you're being isolated. Homelessness. on top of all of the other things that are going on because of PTS. And if these individuals don't have a support system around them to help them see their value and to get through these struggles, those chances skyrocket for suicide. Next slide, please. So who's affected by PTS? That, everybody. PTS does not have boundaries. You can go to the next slide. There is no face, as I said before, for PTS. I think most people think military first responders. But this affects children. It affects people from every walk of life. There are no boundaries with this. And the numbers I talked about in the beginning, we all face trauma. And if we are not prepared, if we've not built resiliency up as we are faced with those traumas, if we don't have the support system in place, if we are not aware of what those signs and symptoms are that we're going to face, it becomes very, very overwhelming and it is very daunting to face that. Next slide, please. So when we are beginning to interact with individuals that have PTS and speaking from my job in law enforcement corrections, it's a, co it's a coordinated collaboration. I was previously the ADA coordinator for our agency, and anytime that we had somebody come into custody, 
that had PTS. It was myself, it was our mental health team, our medical team, counselors, everybody worked together because one person can't do this. There are so many different facets to this. And that should be your response for any time you're interacting with someone with a disability, with mental illness. It needs to be a coordinated collaboration because you want to make sure that you're providing everything that the person needs to help them. So if you're currently working in a position, whether it's an ADA coordinator or an officer or whatever it may be, a teacher, utilize your resources. I know at the college, we have an app called Starfish and we have the ability to bring in all the teachers, all the counselors, the coaches, everybody together and exchange information so that we can provide the best possible solution and resources for our students. That is how you're successful in this. Next slide, please. So we look at PTS and the Americans with Disabilities Act. We're looking at accommodations, service animals. But at the end of the day, this is common sense. Treat everyone with dignity and respect. How you would want to be treated or you would want a family member of yours to be treated. I went to listen to David Fram, who is the National Employment Law Institute's Director of ADA Services. One of the best speakers I've ever seen. I don't think I've ever seen anybody as excited about the ADA as this gentleman is. He's almost like a game show host. And for eight hours, I sat and listened to him and I felt like I was there for 10 minutes. And the one thing he wanted you to take away from this was the five magic words. How can I help you? And across the board, whether it's PTS or any other disability or accommodation, how can I help you? Common sense, dignity, respect. We want each other to be successful. And we want to do as much as we can to ensure that success. And most of these accommodations don't cost anything. Sometimes it's just being there and listening that brings a great relief knowing that there is a support system there knowing that somebody cares and somebody is listening to them as they're explaining what they're going through telling them you believe in them next slide please PTS is not something that you can take a cookie cutter approach to because it is different in each and every person that you're going to interact with. There's a lot of the same symptoms, but much like any other disability, when somebody comes to you for an accommodation, they may only need one thing. And you may have someone else that comes and needs five or six. And as an ADA coordinator, and I tell this to the new recruits when they come in, as an officer, you've got to remember every person that you interact with is dealing with something different. They have a different background. They're coming from a different walk of life. You can't treat everybody the same way. And your first interaction 
being open and listening and treating the person with dignity and respect sets the stage for the rest of your interactions. How can I help you? And then listen. While they're talking, don't sit and get all your answers together in your head. Listen. And then reflect back to them on what they said. Next slide, please. And I've already said this numerous times, it's not just military and first responders that are dealing with this. I talked earlier about the study with the vets coming back after 9-11. And there was another study done of the first responders to the um, World Trade Centers. And every one of those responders that had been diagnosed with PTSD, their children were taking on the same exact signs and symptoms as they were in school. They were withdrawing. They were acting out. Their moods were changing. They weren't sleeping. So... If you have PTS and you want to be one of the officers, military vets, whoever it is, you're too proud to ask for help for yourself, know that when you don't, the chances are this is going to overflow to your children if you have children. It also overflows to those around you. But for the little ones, they're going to mimic what they are seeing. In the first book that I wrote, called Why Won't You Play With Me, it was about my conversations that I had with my now 10-year-old son about what I was going through. And he asked me, why won't you play with me one day while I was laying in bed depressed in the middle of the day? So I had to find a way to talk to him about what I was going through, about what I saw, what I was feeling, without being graphic. And last year, I was able to finally take him to the Pentagon Memorial. And as we were walking around the Pentagon Memorial, and I was talking to him about the benches and we got to the wall where the plane hit, and I lost it. I broke down. And this little nine-year-old puts his arm around me, and he says, Daddy, I think we need to go home now. And he held my hand, and we walked back to the car, and he started crying. And when we got home, granted, he's nine. Everybody goes in the house and he stops me and he says, Dad, can we have a private conversation? And he said, I wanted you to know the reason that I got so upset was because I was afraid you were going to hurt yourself again. That was the first time he had seen me cry. And those conversations that I have had with him have been some of the greatest peer support that I've ever had. Because kids ask you questions without filter. And they want to know everything. And this little guy has opened my eyes to a whole new world of the impact of PTS because then I began looking at how this affects our kids. And he told me once, he said, Dad, you can be very scary when you get upset. And I didn't 
think about it. And he was talking about years before where my moods would switch and I would yell. But you can't tell from this, I'm six foot three and weigh 275 pounds. And before I got into this career as a professional wrestler, so you get used to doing these characters and, and I don't think about that impact that I may have on somebody. But when I stopped and thought about this little guy and how he must have felt with me standing there yelling, he must have been scared to death. And I can only speak for me, but I don't know of any parent that wants their child to be scared or that would want their child to go through any of these symptoms. So if you're suffering with PTS and you don't want to get help for yourself, get it for your kids. And if you know somebody that has it, that's suffering and won't get help, talk to them about that. A lot of times when I go out to speak, I don't get a lot of reaction. The guys will sit there and when I go do the book signings afterwards, people will stand in line and then you'll see a group of guys that are around the room and they're standing in all different places. And as everybody goes away, then they walk up and they're like, oh, I got this friend or, you know, this happened to so-and-so. And it's for them. But when I, the last time that I spoke up in Canada and I discussed this and I talked about the book, you saw the arms come across. And you saw all these tough people that have kids. And as they came up and talked to me, it all reflected on their kids. When you're interacting with someone with PTS, you have to use whatever it takes to get through. The number of children that we have now that are dealing with depression and dealing with these same signs and symptoms, and then you look at suicide and you look at the number of young kids, I'm not talking about teenagers, I'm talking about young kids, 9, 10, 11, that have completed suicide because of bullying and depression and have had the signs and symptoms of PTS. And now they're not allowed to go to school and all their interactions on a computer. And everybody says, oh, this is the best time of your life. This is great. When you're a kid, they have a tough go of it. When I first start teaching my classes, the first week of any class is about health and wellness. And I open up to my students about my experiences. And I cannot tell you the number of students that have come up to me throughout the semesters and told me about their own experiences because I opened up to them. Share your journeys. You never know the impact you're going to have. Next slide, please. People will tell you all throughout life that you can't change the world. But I will argue that you can by doing what I just said. Share your journey. You don't need to go into graphic detail, but share your struggle. One of the things I've noticed with when we do these rock videos is the responses that we get from other people. People that look forward to seeing these videos and me and the guy that originally started doing this, we would always joke around that we're these two big fools walking around with this weight on our back saying stupid stuff because we don't know what to talk about. But whatever it was, it connected with people. And it helped people. And we didn't think it would do anything. And when you share your journey, 
You may have a crowd of a thousand people and one person hears it, but that person tells somebody and then they tell somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. And eventually with that one voice, you can begin to change the world. And if nothing else, you change it for that one person that's in the audience. When I spoke last May at the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation World Conference in Baltimore, I was doing a presentation on the journey and after the presentation, you know, I got my, my whole family came to see it. All of my mentors were there. Um, the people that had done EMDR on me and had counseled me and provided me help throughout the years were all there in this room. And a lady walked up to me again and handed me a folded up piece of paper and she said, I don't have the words right now, but when you get a chance, open this up. So I got upstairs and I opened the paper and it said, I have a friend and I sent her a picture of you from the, the guidebook about the conference and what you were talking about. And she sent this note back. And it said, my husband was killed in the Pentagon on 9-11. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for keeping his memory alive and the memory of all those that died that day. Don't ever stop doing what you're doing. God bless you. In her name. And just two days before, as my PTS would have it, I had been doubting myself and wondering, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is this what I should be doing? And that note told me, yes, this is what I should be doing. Because what are the chances of all the people in the world that our paths cross that day, at that moment? And that that young woman that was there took that picture and sent it to this lady that she knew. One voice can change the entire world. Next slide, please. Coming out on top. The tips that I would give you is never stop learning. Never stop learning about yourself and about what you're going through. You're your best advocate, regardless of whether it's PTS or any other disability that you may be challenged with. You are the best advocate that there is for yourself. And I myself, in another two weeks, are going to Boulder Crest um, retreat for seven days for military and first responders with PTSD. And after all these years of this, I am going to be going up there for a week. And then for 18 months after that, the group that I get to work with during that week will be meeting for the next 18 months to ensure that I have the tools that I need to be successful and to battle the struggles that I had. And while I am doing a thousand times better than I was, there's still struggles here and there. And it's up to me to be my best advocate. And not only am I doing that for myself, I'm doing it so that I can go up and come back and report back to my agency and provide other officers that may be struggling as well with another option for getting help. Next slide, please. When an individual has purpose, they have meaning. Make sure that you allow those people that you come in contact with to know how important they are. Whether it's in his employer, whether it is in a role as an ADA coordinator, a teacher, whatever it may be. For me, I just had a young lady over the weekend that is in one of my classes that was struggling really bad. And I got on the call with her and I just said, I believe in you. We're gonna get through this. And she began just bawling her eyes out. 
And she said she had never asked for help and she didn't think she would be able to get any help. And that's why she hadn't asked for it. But because I had opened up to them at the beginning of the semester and told them about my own struggle, she felt that she could open up to me. And I reminded her of how much she had been through to this point. This was just one little bump in the road. As you're interacting with folks, interact with the individual, not the disability. Dignity and respect and give them purpose to move forward. Next slide, please. And I will wrap up with this. This is another thing that I got from Canada, from Mindy and Chris. The Japanese art of Kintsugi. The Japanese believe when their pottery breaks, they will not throw it away. They put it back together with 24 karat gold. And they believe that by doing that, it makes it stronger than it was originally. So we go back to Sturgeon's quote. For God makes someone great, he will shatter them into a million pieces. When I heard this last year, I'm sorry, it was 2018 when I heard this, it brought tears to my eyes because I was shattered. And along this journey, from all of those people that have crossed my path, they were my gold. And through those interactions, I was able to be put back together to stand in front of you, to stand in front of people around North America. be this big goofy guy that carries weights and shoots videos every night to write kids books to help them better understand and give an opportunity for somebody with PTS to have those conversations with their children me who in 2003 sat on the couch in a dark room in my house with my gun to my head continued on my path instead of ending it. It was put back together by all of these people. And I hope that today I've been able to provide some gold to each and every one of you, whether it's for yourself, someone that you know, or someone that you may interact with down the road. Thank you for your time. And I greatly appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much, um, Mr. McMichael. Um, I'm taking a look to see if there are any questions in here. Um, first off, we did have one comment, which is uh, the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation states um, that if a suicide were tracked as a line of duty death, I guess an LODD, uh, the number of firefighters dying as an LODD would more than double. So, something to think about. Um, I believe last year when we had the 228, there was 146 or 47 line of duty deaths, just to give you some perspective on that. And those are the documented ones. Mm -hmm. um, so one question here, if you have a longer length of time suffering from PTS, is there uh, a correlation there? Is there a higher risk of suicide? That I would not wager to answer because I'm not a doctor. Um, <laughs> but. I, for me, when 
my um, when my time happened where I almost ended my life, it was at the very beginning. Um, and I think it all, this is just my opinion, of course, I think it is depending on your support system. When you don't have anyone around you, I think it becomes very, very, very unbearable. And it feels like the weight of the world is on you. Because once I got help and I started um, learning different ways to um, learn my triggers and that type of thing, I was able to better handle it. There's still days where I struggle, but I think once you learn how to handle the triggers and know when things are coming, it gets a little bit better to deal with. So I would, I would think that would need to be something that um, we have to look at the research on. Great, thank you. A um, couple people are asking here where they can find your books. Yeah, I will put my website and information in the chat box here. And they are, they're on the website there's direct links they're sold on amazon so if you go to the website it'll give you the links to each of the books okay i'm just taking a look here so that i you put it in the question box i figured i could read it in the chat box in the chat box okay hold on just a second here okay um so it looks like here it's uh www catalysts of change associates.com uh, for anybody that's got my contact information and all that stuff great thank you um, let's see let me uh, let's see this says I am a if I'm a first responder but do not have PTS how can I best help someone who appears to be going through PTS that hasn't reached out for help and may not even see that they have a problem. I think the, I think the biggest thing where we fall short as first responders is, and I use the example of we go on a call and you get a call to somebody's house that thinks they have gnomes in their yard. So we respond to the call and we'll stand there for 20 minutes and we will listen to how the gnomes are tearing the grass up and everything else. And, you know, you're very nice, you listen, you take the report, and you go about your business. But when we come back to the locker room and we see one of our men or women struggling, we won't stop and ask them, are you okay? Out of fear, and again, my opinion, it's out of fear that they're going to say no. The biggest thing you can do is listen. Ask direct questions, are you okay? It, you, you don't know how much of a weight that takes off of the person. I don't remember the gentleman's name. There's a documentary on, I believe it's Netflix or Amazon, that jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge. And he was one of eight people in the history of the Golden Gate Bridge that survived that jump. And he talks about, he was standing there getting ready to jump and he saw a lady walking towards him and he thought that she was going to ask him, are you okay? And when she got up to him, she handed him a camera and said, can you take a picture of me? And he took the picture of her, handed her the camera back, and he jumped. And he, along with the other seven people that survived that jump, all said the minute that their feet left the bridge, the only thing they could think is that I want to live. Asking the direct questions and allowing them to openly respond without judgment is a huge weight off of that person's shoulders. And have, have your resources, whether it's the agency has an EAP, they have a clinician that's on call, or just some of the other resources that are available in your area. Um, bluehelp.org is one of, they've got just a ton of listings on there for suicide prevention and awareness. Have that information with you so that way if you do ask somebody and they, they tell you that they're in crisis, you have those, those uh, resources there. That's great. Thank you. Um, just a comment. Um, thank you so very much for your raw, open honesty and your willingness to share 
what some would consider to be a taboo topic. Um, and then uh, there's some other things down here. Hold on just a second. Um, another just a comment. Um, we've had three suicides in our department of 50 in the last couple of years, and it's rough. So, um, very sorry to hear that. Let's see. Um, just going through here. Um, I had one uh, question. It, and is there a relationship between PTS and traumatic brain injury? Are they the same thing? Is PTS a form of that? How, how do those connect up? The, they're two separate things, but there is research showing, um, I believe it was on the VA website, they had a bunch of research on there mm -hmm. showing the link between the two. But they're two separate standalone incidents. Gotcha. Um, is there an expected kind of time frame for recovery from PTS, or is it something that can occur, you know, years after the actual uh, triggering event happened? <clears throat> I think depending on who you're asked, they'll tell you different things. Um, and it goes back to what I said about the instead of using PTSD, they say PTSI for injury because they'll heal. I have been battling with it now for 19 years and it's gotten better because I understand my triggers, but I, are still, I still battle with pieces of it. Um, some people have very short term effects of it, the three months or less. Um, and I think that when we get, if you begin training, especially with officers and military prior to them going out into the field, in the academies and basic training, if you get that resilience built, that lowers the the impact of these incidents because they understand this is what i'm going to endure after this um, and when you have things happen like flashbacks and nightmares oftentimes you start to feel like you're losing your mind i know for me i did and i've heard that from several other people and you're afraid to ask for help because you don't know what's going on with you if you can make folks aware before they endure these things, it helps immensely by building the resiliency up. So I don't know that there's a specific time frame. I think it just depends on the person. It depends on your counseling because you may go to 10 counselors before you find that right counselor that you click with. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I saw one question here. Um, so uh, this person is saying, I'm wondering if captioning or captioning services would help those who are not able to focus in classrooms due to flashbacks since they are able to get a transcript of everything that was said in the classroom emailed to them later. Would this be considered to be, you know, an effective type of accommodation? It would be if it worked for them. Um, and now it's the classroom is so much different now because I know for me, my classes are now on zoom. So, and I had a great experience just a few days ago last week, as I was prepping for this, where I learned all about how to make my presentations, um, ADA compatible with, um, the viewers, and I'm sure I'm going to mess this up, but the, the viewers and the listening devices and things like that where I hadn't before, and they ran the test on my PowerPoint, I think it was like 193 errors with it, and um, Nancy gave me a education very quickly on how I can go in and fix it. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do, especially as a teacher, where you can not only do the captioning, but she was telling me that you can do the PowerPoints, print out the outlines, um, and be descriptive of your pictures in there and that type of thing to describe those. Um, I always put my PowerPoints up online so that they can go through them as slow as they need to. Um, but I also let them know if they're having, if they're struggling with anything, to let me know, regardless of what it is. 
And depending on how big your classes are, it could be hard to do that. I mean, you have classes where you've got over 100 students in them. It's hard to do that. But to me, it's important to try to have that relationship with each of the students and understand and it make them able to have that opening to come ask me questions, email me, text me, whatever it is, so that they're not struggling. Gotcha. Um, we had a couple of questions come in. We've got just a couple more minutes here um, that, you know, you're welcome to try to, to answer or they may be good technical assistance questions if people want to call us here at the center. Um, but we, we had one come in through email and the person says, um, I work for a healthcare organization and we have patients that indicate they're unable to wear a mask due to their PTS. So can you recommend any alternatives, um, alternative type accommodations for wearing a mask? Um, you know, considering the current high rate of COVID infection, staff and providers are already pretty anxious. And she says, I know there isn't a one size fits all solution, but any advice would be helpful. I've seen from some um, some agencies are doing, if you can't wear the mask, you can wear a face shield. Um, and then I've gone, I don't know how well you'll be able to see this, but I went and got a mask that has, it's got carbon filters inside and then it's got the um, vents, the breathable vents, because when I used to train, I wore an elevation mask. Mm -hmm. It just makes it easier for me. It um, Velcros around the back of your neck and over your ears so it's much more comfortable. Um, but I would think that that would be something, again, that you would go to either Mid-Atlantic, the doctor, or something of that. They could give you more specific advice, but just from doing – one of the other jobs I had here was doing the COVID-19 response for our department since mm -hmm. it started and um, using the face shields. is I've seen that they've gotten more open about that being an effective replacement for a mask if somebody can't wear the mask just so they have that covering but again the doctor is probably going to be the best or the mid-atlantic um, hotline would be the best source for that great thanks so much sure. um i think we're just about out of time here so i'm going to do our, our wrap-up stuff um we do have some upcoming webinars um, for those who might be interested we have uh, coming up on December 7th, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on corrections and law enforcement, a roundtable discussion. And um, James McMichael, uh, JP actually will be moderating that um, roundtable discussion. And um, again, it's free and you can uh, register at uh, adainfo.org. Um, and then there is a, uh, another webinar called Now What? Reimagining and Rebooting Supports for People with Disabilities in Our New World, uh, which is a Transcend webinar that will be on Thursday, December the 10th. Uh, and for that one, you can register, <clears throat> excuse me, at, at uh, transcend.org. For those of you who registered for a certificate of participation and or continuing education credit, or if you'd like to register for a certificate or credit, refer to the webinar description for information about how to request the certificate and or credit. Um, and again, the Mid-Atlantic uh, Mid ADA Center is part of the ADA National Network, which is a network of 10 different centers that provide information, uh, guidance, training, and materials on the Americans with Disabilities Act. From anywhere in the country, you can reach an ADA center by calling 1-800-949-4232. Um, or you can also send an email to adata.org. Next slide, please. And I want to thank everybody again for joining us. And again, JP, thank you so much for doing that presentation for us. Um, great information and just a, an amazing story. So thank you very much. Um, and again, we are the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center and you can reach us locally by calling 301-217-0124. So 
if anybody had any questions regarding uh, masks <laughs> and the ADA, we are happy to answer those questions for you. So again, thanks everybody so much for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you or having you join us for future webinars and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.